Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Betty from Docker, and today I have with me Alex Strahan and Lee Namba, um, solutions architects who are out on the field working with our um, customers every day. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar um, where we're going to talk about how to containerize and save with Docker Data Center, and specifically around the topic of containerizing existing applications or legacy applications in an environment um, to optimize costs related to your infrastructure. So with that, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be um, made available to you after the event, um, so you can also pass along to your colleagues. Um, if you have any questions um, or comments, please put them in the Q&A and chat windows, and we'll address them at the end of the uh, session. So just keep putting them in there. We're not ignoring you. Um, we'll get them at the end. And with that, I'd like to get started. So for those of you, um, as a quick level set, uh, we want to talk quickly about, you know, who is Docker? And Docker is really the company behind the containeriz containerization movement. Our philosophy is the ability to build, ship, and run any application anywhere. We started off with the open source, um, with an open source project for the core Docker engine, and you'll see below some key statistics around how that's grown uh, dramatically over the last uh, few years. And interestingly, as people have started to initially play with Docker and are moving to taking those applications into production environments, um, we have, we've enhanced on the offering to offer a containers as a service platform. This platform is, um, to, is a, as a modern application platform to embrace um, both IT um, operations teams as well as developers, um, the ability to support any application, any stack running on any infrastructure, and most importantly, um, providing commercial support um, for, for the core um, open source Docker engine as well as providing value-added um, software solutions on top of that for management, orchestration, and security. So, you know, why Docker? You know, when we're looking at how people are looking, um, what people are looking for Docker to help them with, um, what we have found is that organizations are looking to Docker to help to enable critical transformations. So, um, we ran a survey in the early part of this year to find out, you know, what are people most interested in, um, organizations of all sizes, you know, what are their top initiatives for the year, and then what kinds of activities are they looking um, to Docker to help um, solve for them. So first is um, app modernization. Um, three out of the four top initiatives that kind of bubbled to the top were related to modernizing applications, whether that is building new applications that are microservices based or finding ways to kind of modern um, refactor existing applications um, or or um, kind of completely um, or, or provide uh, modern characteristics to an existing app without um, recoding it at all. So all around kind of making that app portfolio more modern. Um, the other bit is how d um, Docker can accelerate uh, the DevOps initiatives. So tied to app modernization is the ability to then, moving forward, make changing those app changing the applications they have much easier and um, faster. Um, and then lastly is 80% um, of those who responded to the survey um, had listed Docker central to their cloud strategy, whether that be migrating to the cloud, um, the, a first uh, time migration, adding additional cloud providers in their portfolio so that they can then have portability around there, or enable a pure hybrid cloud strategy. And that's because um, Docker uniquely um, delivers um, for the application environment uh, agility, portability, and control. This is something, these are the cornerstones of how we build our products and the features around it um, because what's important is many solutions out there may provide speed or agility, like really fast to get, on, get onboarded, but may lack, uh, may lack the ability for operational control. Conversely, um, tools that uh, provide a lot of, oftentimes provide a lot of security and a lot of control and management oftentimes kind of, um, are cumbersome. So we really believe it's important to bring all three of these pillars um, and capa as capabilities into the product set um, because then this is what brings the developers and IT operations together to very quickly innovate and bring applications to market. And with that, you know, the, plas the desired platform for Docker containers as a service is um, any application, any stack, anywhere. We feel this is important because in order to provide a transformative environment um, for applications, it cannot only be for new, you know, microservices or cloud-native apps. because 
Um, what's also important is that organizations have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of applications already in their environment, and we need a way to transition those to a newer model, as well as um, provide a way for new applications to be written in an efficient, modular, um, and modern way. So from the, uh, in order to support the agility, portability, and control for an entire environment, the platform must support all application stages from build, ship, to run, any application architecture from new modern apps to existing legacy apps, any stack, um, operating system, and infrastructure. So we'll go into how that plays out um, with respect to this specific use case. So the, the technology that powers that is a Docker data center platform. As mentioned previously, it's built on the core Docker engine, um, the Docker engine that um, people know and love. Um, part of that, what is, um, what is built around that is the ability to get commercial support and service levels around um, that engine, and then integrating and building on top of that a trusted registry, a private registry, as well as a management plane, the ability to manage and orchestrate containers, applications, um, and control um, the nodes what have you, all of that with all of those um, kind of management and control capabilities integrate with integrated security from the um, engine all the way up to how users, um, containers, and images are managed. So a complete integrated um, platform there, but not an overly prescriptive platform. So the language stacks that a, an organization will want to use do not come pre-prescribed in this platform. This is a framework of which um, organizations can then um, put in the type of content that they need for their team, also decide how they would like to secure it. So the tools are all there, but they are flexible to adapt to the policies of that organization. This platform is also able to run on public cloud infrastructure, um, virtual infrastructure, or on-premise, on, -premise, on uh, bare metal and or virtual. The idea being that uh, what Docker is providing is an abstraction above the infrastructure, so it's at the application level, and then provides a pluggable architecture so that it easily plugs into other systems, logging, monitoring, config management, CID, CI, CD systems, as well as have a plug-in architecture so that the application stack is portable across um, net, um, across networking and or um, storage. So when we looked at how um, the, our users today are approaching dockerizing their environments, um, like, I, like I mentioned earlier that our key is to provide a platform that addresses every application. When we looked at the adoption patterns, what we saw were three primary entry points for when um, a application team wanted to start adopting containers in their environment. First is containerizing monoliths or legacy applications um, because um, people find that it does improve, uh, improve their cost structure a bit um, with the ability to get some greater density um, of, of workloads on existing, um, existing infrastructure. The ability to um, migrate those workloads across, um, across to the cloud um, and then be able to implement some build test um, kind of CI workflows. From uh, that, what people often do is once they've containerized their legacy and or a monolithic application is they can look at, start to target which applications they may start, they may want to transform into microservices or start to break up into services, um, shared services models. Um, not all applications will uh, make it into the number two bucket, but some from some of the existing apps will be transformed. And then lastly, there is new applications that are on um, your target list to develop. Um, this, the Docker's H Docker provides a way for those new applications to be built as microservices. Um, we've seen um, people have uh, micro, quote unquote microservices apps that are 10, 20 services, all the way to an extreme of you know 400 services to make a you know e-commerce shopping portal. So that's uh, how micro those services are is really up to you and your application team and what um, how far you want to break down each little component. So, you know, why would people want to do, um, why, would, why would people want to containerize existing applications? Well, when we look at application portfolios that people have, you know, those are apps that work. Those are apps that serve a business function. And 
Um, given how um, the changing practices in application development, monolithic applications are expensive. You know, they are expensive to maintain. There's a high cost associated with uh, maintaining legacy applications um, because, you know, the, it's mostly associated with, you know, there's a very long test cycle or what have you. Um, also, the inertia, the, it makes it difficult to um, change legacy apps and the infrastructure. Oftentimes, those things are kind of tightly coupled together from infrastructure all the way up to the application stack. Um, the difficulties around how quickly um, you're able to innovate on existing applications has led to some uh, um, demotivation in some application teams. When I've talked to uh, customers who have already Dockerized, one of, one of the key things they want to do is empower developers to be more creative and also to be more free to make things um, at the speed at which they would like. Um, and with the existing applications and kind of the waterfall methodology, um, people have found that there are dev and ops conflicts. It's, okay, I passed my test, I'm just going to pass it over the wall, and then once I um, deploy that application to the you know, staging and or production environment, something breaks because there are different um, dependencies and things and um, components installed in each environment. And then always security and compliance is something that um, is kind of a constant thing to maintain, um, regardless of you know, the application or whatever. Different um, companies and different industries have compliance requirements and you know, security is kind of an always there checkbox. So reasons, uh, you know, people are looking to containerize, um, prim you know, because existing apps are expensive uh, to maintain, so how can they address that? So example number one, Dockerize to increase density and reduce costs. As you can see in the before and after diagram below, before what we have seen is that where people would have one application um, per uh, let's say a virtual machine, or even like one application per physical host running bare metal. Um, that's a one-to-one -one, um, use case, and typically what that, can, that what can happen is um, it's not using all the resources available on that host. What we have found some customers um, to do is they would then containerize that workload and be able to get more of those, you know, uh, have a one-to-many um, ratio of host to containers, whether that is a physical and or virtual host. Um, people who are using virtualization in their environment, this provides just another level of, um, of flexibility. So you can have many containers on a bare metal host, or you can have um, many containers inside VMs on a physical host. So it just gives more flexibility on how you want to manage the density. If you are, if um, it's, uh, if the direction is to kind of just consolidate the workloads, um, there is an opportunity to lower the overall um, operating system and virtualization costs or redirect those costs to the capacity for new workloads. We have a, um, one, of our, one of our customers featured on our website is Swisscom, and they were able to, by adding uh, Docker to their environment, uh, go from 400 individual MongoDB VMs to 400 containers in 20 VMs. The next um, use case associated with containerizing legacy uh, existing applications is just by containerizing them, um, you're able to provide portability for applications across platforms. Because, um, the, like I mentioned, Docker is an abstraction above the infrastructure, um, above the physical and or virtual infrastructure, by containerizing a workload, um, you'll be able to take something that's running on-premise and possibly move that to a cloud. A classic example is um, I have heard people say, like, you know, if you happen to be using, let's say, VMware, um, and then you are um, on-premise, but you need to, you've been given a directive to move some percentage of workloads to the cloud. The uh, major public cloud providers use, they all use different virtualization technologies in their, um, in their environments, whether it be Zen, Hyper-V, whatever. Um, with that in mind, um, currently today, VM formats are, they're not, they, um, you know, there's like, you would have to convert, find a way to convert it, and then see if that conversion worked, and how will that application work once it's at that new, um, at that new endpoint um, cloud VM. With Docker, what happens is the application itself is fully contained in the container and can move from, you know, uh, Azure to 
AWS or to Rackspace, to Google, to and back to on-premise on with OpenStack and or um, VMware. Um, because it's an abstraction above the infrastructure, it allows that application code to move without um, any impact. You can check out a, um, a, a story on our website regarding PayPal, who's using Docker data center to migrate workloads across um, a hybrid cloud environment. The last bit is um, development and deployment efficiency. Um, because the nature of containers and they're very lightweight, um, people are able to, even if it's a um, you know, legacy and or monolithic application, um, they are able to you know, dramatically reduce the spin up time of that instance of that application. So on average, we have found from our studies of um, customers and users that they're able to reduce the developer onboarding time by 65% because all the dependencies associated with that application are now packaged in that container. Setting up a new developer with their environment no longer requires you know, installing a whole bunch of things to replicate the production environment on their local machine. Um, or if a developer switches from one project to another, um, they, also, uh, they also don't face that um, giant onboarding time purely with system configuration. We have a number of stories um, where uh, companies are saying that they have developers starting and within just doing you know, you know, Docker run, Docker compose up, they're able to get a full copy of the production environment that's containerized running on their laptops literally within, um, you know, within a few minutes of showing up <laughs> on their first day. Um, also, with related to that is speed, um, time to market. Because containers spin up uh, much faster um, and then you're able to have some de um, greater density of workloads in the existing environment, um, we have found that organizations are able to accelerate their time to market and deployment um, from you know, weeks to days or days to hours. It depends on kind of where they're starting from, but because the deployment at times and because there's an isolation um, of the code um, against you know, the other dependencies in the environment, they're able to kind of accelerate that um, deployment time and then not have it be subject um, and face conflicts from all the other things in the environment. And another interesting thing is um, reducing the ongoing maintenance burden. Um, we have a very interesting use case with um, Cornell University. Um, they were spending, and this is with containerizing um, an off-the-shelf application. They containerized Confluence and all the customizations they did around uh, the Confluence environment into, into a Docker container, and they found that by doing that, um, they were able to um, reduce, the, reduce the total hours used to maintain that environment, maintain that application by 10x, something like going from 2,000 hours, man hours a year to um, 200. So this is to do um, any sort of, you know, the patching, the uh, upgrades, um, all those kind of things as well as any support tickets. Um, they were able to kind of um, contain that application and have a very, with their Docker file, have a very clear understanding of all the pieces that are associated with that application and then be able to do, uh, be able to uh, very simply update it, keep it under security compliance, um, all the components that they were using under security compliance, and also make it super easy for um, uh, to have a uh, a DR plan uh, that was that took them from doing like a, a three day um, recovery to down to um, uh, like thirty minutes. And you know, with Docker Data Center in the environment, and then being able to Dockerize the applications to do those various use cases, what what you're able to get is a foundation for containers as a service. Um, because of the core elements of the platform um, with the, you know, the core engine running across um, the build environments as well as the deployment environments, whether that be you know, test stage and production, um, to the integrated registry and the security capabilities, um, the end-to-end -end security capabilities, that is fundamentally the foundation for containers as a service. And that same foundation can then be used um, to build, ship, and run new applications. Um, as well as be, be the environment of which some of these uh, existing applications can then be broken down and um, those services then be um, managed and stored inside of the registry, um, shared across uh, the uh, different application teams, and then deployed and managed in the production environment. So with that, I would like to hand it over to 
Lee and Alex are solutions architects, so they can share um, some tips on how to get started, how to approach um, containerizing existing applications, as well as share some stories of um, organizations they're working on with um, out in the field. So Lee, I've given you the ball, um, so I'm guessing you can drive and you and Alex can both um, uh, share your stories. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Lee, and I'm a solution architect. I have uh, Alex with uh, me as well, another solution architect. And uh, we're in the field, uh, so we're embedded uh, with customers, and we we see them. We're at their offices, and um, we're we're getting our hands dirty um, with the customers right next to them, and we understand all of the different problems that uh, they go through. Um, I've experienced firsthand um, some transformations within some very large organizations using Docker, uh, and uh, it's 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 uh, it's actually quite exciting. Um, so what we wanted to do is um, share with you, um, as an organization, just how to get started. Uh, a lot of times we hear, okay, you know, what is this Docker thing? Uh, we have DevOps. Um, how do we get started um, creating a program and transforming our organization? So we're going to try and take this um, and make it. We're, we're going to generalize a little bit, and for some of you, you you might already be along that path um, better than others. But what we'll do is we'll step back and we'll just say, as, as Betty said, if you've got some legacy applications, how can you then go about moving towards Docker and getting started? Uh, excuse me, I need to go forward. Okay, so um, the basic steps um, that we see in organizations is uh, the first thing to do is to identify some target applications, and these are the ones that will benefit the most uh, from being Dockerized. So once those are identified, then to build um, and create a pilot program for those targeted applications. Now, once um, the pilot program is decided upon, um, there's going to be some, you know, organization considerations. You know, the people who are going to be owning uh, these different processes. So we'll we'll go through that in a little bit of detail. Uh, then there's the actual, you know, getting the technology uh, installed, so that would be Docker Data Center, and then how to containerize uh, those first target applications. So these are the basic steps that we've seen overall in how to get started um, with Docker. Okay, so the first um, the first step is is basically coming up with some sort of criteria uh, to narrow down, you know, your, your applications to a short list. Uh, so we've listed some example criteria here, um, and each organization has different criteria that are important to them, um, but these are some of the ones that, that pop out to us. Um, so a lot of them, especially with legacy applications, is they take a long time to deploy. Uh, so they're just trying to reduce um, how long it takes basically between you get a, a new functional requirement and it gets pushed out to production. So, so that's, that's basically a time to market. Um, and <clears throat> we, we've seen, um, uh, I mean, I've personally seen a company who, who, who was going through some very um, uh, pretty pretty archaic uh, ways of deploying, you know, using Word documents and going through um, just step by step, you know, copying from the Word document into the command line to deploy things. Um, they containerized and dockerized everything, and literally they they've reduced their time to market cycle. As as Betty was saying, they've reduced some of those from from months to weeks, and literally from weeks to days. Uh, so the the actual application, uh, the functional teams, the owners of them, they were very happy because they could see if they had new changes that they needed to make, they could get pushed out much faster. Um, so is that a criteria that's important for for um, applications? Another one, 
as Betty mentioned before, is infrastructure costs. You can have a legacy application and it, it just costs a lot of money to operate. Um, you can densify that using containers and uh, the same thing, um, they can be reduced. I've seen reductions three times, 10 times, sometimes depending on the application um, of costs. Um, security uh, could be a criteria for you. Um, what um, Docker allows you to do with images is to, you know, with the Docker Trusted Registries, you can, you can sign those images. You can make sure that you know exactly what is de being deployed uh, on every single um, uh, host. Uh, and for security, auditing, traceability uh, reasons, that, that could be um, uh, a very important criteria for you. Um, so there's, there's different criteria. Each company will have their own um, try to create a short list uh, and it might be other considerations such as marketing, there might be a, public, um, a big uh, publicity target and having one application that you could say is dockerized up, up and running in production by a certain date, um, that might be the driving factor. There, there's all, all different um, criteria um, that you can take into consideration to get to your short list. Okay, so once um, you have a short list, then you can um, create a pilot program. So uh, we recommend, um, you know, definitely creating objectives, uh, timeline, scope, and performance indicators for a pilot program, uh, just so that you know it's 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 bounded and and there can be um, you know a true goal. Um, and once um, you know your performance indicators are there, then you can also see whether you know the pilot program was successful. Uh, one of the things with legacy applications uh, that we, we recommend is doing uh, what we call lift and shift. So basically, what that means is don't try not to change too many things. Um, now, what does that mean from the application perspective? It means uh, don't don't change the architecture. If, if you have an architecture or a stack, uh, keep it the same. Um, don't, don't use this opportunity necessarily to start changing or upgrading your versions um, of the operating system or your web application server or the application itself. Uh, this will allow you also to, if you want to do comparisons to your existing infrastructure um, and um, your your dockerized infrastructure, you you can at least do you know let's say you want to do performance testing, you can um, you know do a more apples to apples um, uh, testing um, if those you know and, and fulfill some of your your KPIs. Uh, one customer. Um, uh, that I had recently, uh, they actually had two teams. Uh, one was doing it the Docker way, the other one was doing just a, a classic uh, VM migration and um, they had the exact same versions of everything and that's how they were able to, to monitor um, you know, which team was gonna win. Um, well, the, um, it, it's not a big surprise, but the Docker team <laughs> uh, won pretty easily. Um, uh, okay, so, and then the other uh, thing about lift and shift is keep the deployment simple. Uh, so, um, if, if you already have some type of elastic deployment then on, on your legacy applications, then, then keep it that way. Um, but if you don't, then um, just, just keep your deployment simple, static, uh, if, if there's only one um, or, or, or a fixed number of reverse proxies or a fixed number of um, application servers, then, then uh, keep it and uh, with about the same sizing. Um, one other thing uh, in the pilot program is try to uh, focus on, on one main objective. Um, either it's going to be getting your deployments and time to market faster or ramping up uh, development environments faster um, or uh, doing a uh, hybrid uh, cloud, uh, trying to put some of them on the cloud and some of them um, staying on-premise. On um, but if you try to accomplish too much at the same time, then that can, that can dilute and um, 
your pilot program uh, and lose some focus on that. And basically, another recommendation, and we've, we've seen this, uh, Alex and myself, we're, we're working um, with some customers, uh, and th they're taking a slightly opposite approach, which is they're trying to, to design a gigantic um, Docker infrastructure first, um, and, and resolving all sorts of design issues uh, before even deploying a single application. Um, what, what we would recommend instead is to get to dockerizing something, get it all the way through production, and then once that's there, then you can start to iterate and, and um, scale out from there. But it's important, uh, even from a cultural perspective within the organization, to just get something out all the way to production. Uh, Alex, please chime in if you if you want to add anything uh, to that. No, I think that that's really um, uh, an important point, and it's it's mostly taking the lessons from software development, uh, making small changes, and making a lot of changes instead of having a big integration point. This is mutation that has happened in software development. And maybe when we think in terms of platforms and infrastructure, we, we don't necessarily follow this, but Docker is also an enabler to move some of these practices to, to infrastructure, and I think that that's very important to, to be successful. Yeah. Um, okay. So once your pilot program is defined, uh, there has to be people uh, behind it that are going to execute it. And uh, as Betty was mentioned earlier is, um, you know, DevOps is, is a big uh, part and Docker is an enabler of DevOps in a lot of ways. Um, now your, your company or organization might be already have a DevOps program in place and, and, um, and so you won't you won't have to deal with this. Some of the companies that that we've seen is they're using Docker as as an enabler to help their DevOps program uh, get off the ground. So some some things you might want to consider is and what we've seen is okay. Let's say you have a classic uh, organization where you have an ops team uh, and you have a dev team or development teams. Um, so what are how will Docker influence these these people? Uh, so typically your operations team they'll be installing and maintaining the Docker data center platform. Um, they'll also be concerned with you know monitoring, logging, the storage systems, network, all of all of the things that that they're currently with their existing infrastructure that they're concerned with. They um, typically or will sometimes provide the Docker base images. So these are the equivalent today of, let's say, your RPMs that you use uh, through your corporate infrastructure, um, your base packages of software, you know, stacks or components that you already um, distribute through your enterprise. Those just translate to becoming Docker base images, uh, which, which are very easy to distribute. Uh, and they'll also be concerned with um, any type of deployment workflows, if, if there already is a continuous deployment uh, system going, um, then they will be interested in how that works into um, pulling images from a Docker tr trusted registry and then deploying it into um, production. Now, the development teams, uh, how they'll be impacted is they'll, they'll continue to de uh, develop and test their applications. Um, but then what they'll do is they'll start to build application images from the base images uh, that the ops team provided. And they'll add in, you know, any, any customizations that they need for their particular application. Uh, they'll deploy their containers locally to their, their development machines, uh, and they can test them locally. Um, they'll also, um, if there's an integration team or not, they'll, they'll be, um, uh, working on the continuous integration workflows, the, the unit testing, integration testing, um, and if it passes through all of those stages in, in your CI process, then the image can then be pushed into the Docker Trusted Registry uh, to then be pulled 
by the operations team and then deployed into production. Um, so if, if um, we've, uh, personally, I've, I've seen this in, in a couple of organizations now where there are two uh, distinct teams and there is the wall, uh, the wall of confusion. Uh, Docker is, uh, a, 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 and DDC is a platform that both teams will use. Uh, so what can help at times is um, a DevOps coach uh, and with the pilot program and what they can do is they can help to manage this transition. Uh, a lot of times um, either team um, they'll take part ownership, but then if, if, you know, things can still fall through the cracks. So that's where a coach can come in, help to implement uh, processes and workflows. And, and if there is any arbitration that has to happen between the teams, then they can escalate that up to the proper people and, and help to get that arbitrated. Uh, of course, what Docker uh, would provide is, is a, uh, this unified platform that aggregates these two teams. Uh, and then we'll provide the technical support. Uh, we can do training. Uh, we can also give architectural guidance. That's that's what Alex and myself do, um, depending you know on your your customer or your uh, requirements. Uh, and then finally, what we also do is we can provide access and advocacy. <clears throat> and what that means is uh, we gather feedback uh, from the field. And what that does is that influences the Docker uh, roadmap, product roadmap. Uh, okay, so those are ways in which Docker can, um, or, or just considerations uh, to take into account uh, on your organization. So once the pilot program is, has been established and the owners and, and people taking responsibility for it, um, or empowered, then you can go ahead and start. There, there are two tracks, uh, final tracks, and they can even be done in parallel. Um, the first is obviously installing Docker Data Center. Uh, and so that includes the different components um, that Betty described earlier. Uh, and so this will be normally the ops team. And there are some considerations to, to take into account. For example, uh, it will it be a, a running on existing infrastructure. So uh, if you already have a virtualized environment, it can run on top of virtual machines. Lots of customers do that today. Uh, it can run on bare metal. Uh, will it, or will it be a brand new infrastructure? Uh, will it be in the cloud? So what, what is the infrastructure that will, it'll go on? Uh, and then once the infrastructure is, is decided upon, then all of the sub, um, the subjects below it need to, you know, be discussed, such as networking, storage, um, also disaster recovery. Are there several data centers? Um, all of those considerations uh, need to be taken into account. Now, the second uh, track, then, so once once the ops team can can get going and, and install the Docker data center. Then there is the actual process in Dockerizing. So these are these are the apps teams, and what I'll I'll do is I'll I'll take you through a, a typical process of Dockerizing a legacy application. So once you have uh, your short list um, and you have one of your applications, let's say it's a, a typical stack. Um, I'll just say there's an Apache um, reverse proxy, and then there's a Tomcat application server with the Java 4 running in it, uh, and then let's say a database with Postgres uh, on the back end. So the first thing um, that we would do is um, take a look and see if those components have already been Dockerized. Uh, and one great resource is the Docker Hub. So this is a public um, uh, place where a lot of organizations and software vendors, uh, especially open source uh, software vendors, uh, publish their images and their official images that, that they uh, provide. Um, and so that is that is on the Docker Hub. Um, now a lot of companies they they don't they won't allow their corporate policy isn't to allow pulling images directly from a public Docker Hub. 
uh, they have to go through some sort of vetting process for security reasons, or even to add in uh, custom libraries that that are that they use throughout the enterprise, such as let's say a single sign-on, um, or monitoring or logging libraries that they use. But um, the the nice thing um, about Docker is you have Docker files uh, that create the images. So you actually have access to the source code of these images. And those are published as well on Docker Hub. So you can take these Docker files um, and you can actually modify them to your needs. And you can be inspired by um, some of uh, the official images on the Docker Hub. So I would, let's say, go and look at the official, let's say, Apache um, image, I would take that Docker script and then I would say, okay, I need to add in my single sign-on libraries to it. Uh, and then I would also want to follow um, best practices. Uh, and those are also on, on the Docker website. And these will allow you to optimize your images for size and also for reusability. Um, and there's, there's a whole long list of, of best practices uh, to follow. So once um, let's say, okay, I'm, I'm building my, uh, my Apache um, image. I can then run it locally and I can test it and see if I got my basic Apache running. I can test it so with a web browser and I've dockerized it and everything works. So then I can hopefully by now um, Docker Data Center is installed. Uh, I can then push my image that I've created I can push that to uh, the Docker Trusted Registry. Um, and then on the other side, uh, the, the, the person who's deploying can then pull that image that I've pushed uh, from the Docker Trusted Registry and deploy that uh, using Docker Data Center and, and the Universal Control Plane uh, into a production environment. And we can test that first container to see if it's gone from development all the way to production. Now, once we've, and, and, and there'll be, you know, some, some obviously some um, workflow issues and assigning roles and role-based um, um, role um, permissions uh, as to who can push images and that kind of stuff. But what we want to do is do, just do a first test of pushing it from a development platform all the way to production uh, with just one container. Once we've done that, then we can um, dockerize the other components in my stack. So then I'll try and go uh, and dockerize a Tomcat, dockerize uh, Postgres, and then I'll integrate all of those three pieces together using Docker Compose. Uh, so that's the tool that basically says this is how Apache talks to Tomcat and how Tomcat will then talk to Postgres. They can all be um, uh, linked up together on their own private network so nobody else can access them and they can only Apache needs to be exposed, for example, the port um, of Apache can be exposed. Um, and so that will all be in a Docker Compose uh, file and I will deploy that locally and test to make sure that whole stack runs together and that all of the configuration uh, works um, together. And I can test that using a web browser locally. Once that stack uh, is, is done, then I can push those other two images of Tomcat and Postgres into the Docker Trusted Registry, um, as well as I can put my Docker Compose into some type of uh, let's say Git or, or source control, that then the, the deployment team can pull those images and also um, use the Docker Compose uh, to then deploy that stack into production. And that will be a first test of getting one first application from development all the way through uh, to production as a first vertical deployment. So this is just an example that we were talking about earlier of start small and then slowly grow a little bit bigger with each step. Uh, and then, so that, that'll be a first uh, deployment. And then the final um, process, so once that, that first app is, is deployed, then it'll be time to, 
to basically step back and reevaluate some things. So there will be many questions that need to be answered. Uh, and that first app will probably have a lot of hard-coded configuration and types of decisions that, that might impact the whole enterprise or just the team. We don't, you won't quite know what, what values to put in there just yet. Um, so then you need to step back and start thinking, okay, um, there's many ways to, to develop images. Uh, one way is you can make them flexible and put all of the configuration outside of the container and then just inject them right at runtime. Um, that makes things very flexible and you can change things very quickly and you don't have to rebuild uh, the images. So that's very good for, uh, for development. Another uh, way is you can make images or containers immutable. Uh, so basically what you do is you copy in all of your configuration files, that maybe um, private keys, certificates into the image. Uh, and what that, and then that basically bakes it in and, and, and makes it immutable. And what that does is it can help to increase security um, and also portability because you know that everything in that you need to run this image or this container is, is, is contained within the image. And when I, when I copy that image or I push that image to another platform, everything uh, goes along with it and I don't have to inject anything uh, from the outside. Um, so it's considered immutable. Uh, or you can have a strategy where you do both, where in development you override uh, certain configuration so that it is flexible and then as it goes moves through the, the pipeline through all of the different environments that say development, functional testing, performance testing, UAT, um, all the way staging and then to production, uh, you harden the images along the way so they become more and more secure um, as it goes from dev uh, all the way to production. Um, Another things that will come up uh, to decide upon are, do you need an image hierarchy? Uh, so for example, let's say um, I have a base image and that's Red Hat, let's say Red Hat 7. Um, and uh, so my Apache can inherit from Red Hat 7 and my Tomcat and also Postgres, they can all inherit from Red Hat 7. So let's say there's a security patch on Red Hat uh, I just update the base image and then all of my images that inherit from the base image, they get those security patches um, automatically. I don't need to redo any type of, of scripts or recipes to update um, and patch all of these different environments. I just have to rebuild my images. Uh, now let's say I have other legacy applications. Um, I not only have Tomcat, but I have JBoss and I also maybe have a WebLogic. Well, they all um, maybe use the same uh, version of Java, so I have JDK 7 or JDK 8. Uh, so what I can do is I can build a hierarchy where I have Red Hat 7, and then I have a Java 8, JDK 8, let's say, and then off of that I can have a Tomcat, JBoss, and WebLogic. Now let's say there's a, um, a security library or some additional um, feature and you want to add to my JDK, uh, all I have to do is add it to the JDK and then my, my JBoss and my Tomcat and my WebLogic will all inherit those, um, those new um, uh, libraries. So that's a way in which uh, corporations can enforce standards across you know, uh, an enterprise and also seamlessly upgrade a lot of applications all at once. And I've seen this in practice, and it, and it is very, very powerful. It saves a lot of time. Um, another, um, another thing that issues that could come up uh, once you once you sort of step back and reevaluate is now you can now that you've got a first one or two applications out is okay. Now we can maybe start doing some scalability, uh, making our applications more elastic. So depending on demand um, and load. Uh, we can start to automatically scale out and pop up containers uh, as load grows or not. So those are things that Docker Data Center provides, and now we can we can start to really use uh, those features uh, in DDC. Uh, a 
other things to do is now, um, now I can finally upgrade my components. So let's say I wanted to upgrade um, from Java 7 to Java 8, or I wanted to upgrade to, or maybe even test out um, a different uh, OS uh, to run all of my, my uh, Java applications on. So I can, I can start just changing out base images, inheriting from different base images, and I can test all my, my existing applications without changing any lines of code. So these are all things that can happen um, very, very easily. Uh, then another thing uh, is to, um, as Betty said, now that we've done a legacy app, now um, why don't we try and break up this big monolithic uh, application into microservices. So now that we have some experience with Docker and containers and how to build them, okay, we can start building these microservices and adding them right on next to our legacy apps and slowly start to break it up. That becomes a lot easier. And then obviously once you've got a pilot program um, going, then you start to generalize it to the rest of your applications. Um, that's, uh, that's basically um, what our what we've seen in the in the with our customers uh, as our recommended way to to get started uh, with Docker and, and how to approach it. Um, Alex, do you have anything, or Betty? I'll hand it back to you. Uh, there's just something I wanted to add is that um, there's a lot of things to consider, and uh, during the process. Uh, there's going to be a lot of decisions uh, on all these topics, but it shouldn't be seen uh, as something that is a, a huge work, uh, amount of work to do uh, and to plan for before starting. Right? It's more going to be a, an iterative process where, where you refine some of these decisions. And, and the whole idea is that you, you can start now where you are. And the, the main process, the main idea behind um, Dockerizing existing application, legacy applications, that you can start with these applications um, right now and you can start transforming them and transforming the processes you have around building, deploying, building images, how you distribute them, uh, refining security processes, and so on. All of that is going to be a process. And part of the value is that uh, you can onboard them on this platform right now uh, and this. Uh, first step is going to provide you with the first question, but also some of the answers to, to all these considerations. Awesome. So I am scrolling through just the Q&A here really quick um, so we can help answer some of these. Um, you know, with regards to pricing, um, Docker Data Center is available as a monthly and or annual subscription. Um, it varies by support level, so the packages um, have a business day support, which is 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, local time, or business critical, which is 24 by 7 by 365. Um, it is priced per node, so per physical or virtual node in which Docker Engine is installed, and it's uh, the U.S. list price is $1,500 for business day and $3,000 for uh, business critical per node. Um, and then there's a monthly version that is available for purchase online for people who want to um, try that kind of subscription. Um, additionally, Docker Data Center is available with a free 30-day trial, so you can sign up for a trial, download the software, um, and get the license key for 30 days um, so that people can, um, you guys can kind of try it out in your own environment. Or if you'd like a more, um, a more uh, like a trial experience where you don't have to physically install things yourself, um, once you register for your trial license key, we have a um, template for an ARM template in Azure as well as a cloud formation template for AWS. That'll kind of, um, you pick how many worker nodes um, that you need in your cluster, and then if you want high availability um, of, the, of the management and registry uh, components, and then it'll just kind of spin all that stuff up for you. Um, so you'll just be using those native um, cloud portals um, and that UI to kind of set that up. So that's one thing you can um, try there. And then um, uh, apologies if anybody had some issues with the audio. This is recorded, so we'll send out the recording and the slides after the, um, after the session. Um, there's a question here on the breakdown of costs of legacy apps and where Docker helps reduce, eliminate these costs. Um, that is very much a your mileage may vary because it depends on your application. 
um, as well as how you're, you know, supporting that application today um, and how often you're, you know, updating or patching and how long those take. Um, so with the, the examples that we presented here do show um, for, uh, like, Cornell specifically, um, what their experience was in dockerizing Confluence. They went from 2,000 hours a year to 200. They also were able to do things like um, up, just upgrading Confluence um, based on an upgrade that um, Atlassian um, releases took them six months to implement. And now they're able to actually uh, implement an upgrade much faster, and they're able to upgrade four times a year. So um, those are the kind of variants that apply, but it is still very application dependent. Um, and then, uh, so it's important to, I think, as you go down this path is when you pick a target application, try to understand, um, you know, what has to ha what what kind of maintenance and support burden you are um, facing with that application um, before going down the project so that you're able to then kind of track what the delta was, because that can be a good guide, like a, a rough estimate for you as you embark on containerizing subsequent applications. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a guideline and each application will be a little bit different. Um, the Dan had a, Jones had a question that if uh, my legacy app is a typical three-tier app, do I put this in a single container or do I need to put each in its own container? Alex answered this that it, um, already online, but we'll just talk about it on this call here, is in most cases that you would have a separate container for each, and then you will then um, connect those containers together to form that application. And then um, Rahul had a question around um, how to actually containerize Confluence, um, because he's looking at doing um, that. Uh, doing a POC around that today. So what we will do is we have a blog post um, specific to the Cornell um, case study that we'll share out as part of the follow-up email. But um, we will also um, get with um, Sean, who is the um, cloud, the architect over at um, Cornell, to get uh, some of the, the, the technical how-to details uh, specified. Um, would uh, Jay's got a question here? Uh, would DDC, Docker Swarm Kit, Docker for Azure, AWS all work together? Um, DDC today, um, Docker Data Center today ships with um, Engine 111. We will be um, we will be releasing soon um, Docker Data Center with 112. So um, Data Center today um, does not have the const uh, does not have the services constructs in there, but um, we will be releasing that soon. And so you'll have all the things with as part of um, that you're able to do with 112 um, expressed in the in the um, user interface. So the screenshots you saw here did not have that. Uh, how do I get started dockerizing legacy Windows apps? Um, Windows support um, is coming, so um, I urge you to go to the um, evaluation center of for, for Microsoft, um, and if you have like a if you have like an MSDN license, it'll be available there too. But Windows Server 2016 is what will support Docker. Um, you will need Windows Server 2016 as well as um, the Docker engine um, that has been ported um, to run on Windows, um, to, so that you can then um, start that experience. Um, it is in tech. The Windows Server 2016 is in tech preview today, but you can try it out um, in Azure and MSCN and their TechNet Evaluation Center. Um, the process for um, dockerizing those will be very, um, it's, it's um, the user experience, um, because it is still the um, Docker uh, client that you'll be um, using as an end user to, uh, to instantiate containers to build them. It is all, it's the same um, as it is in Linux. Um, there's a question from the collaboration with clients. What were some of the challenges for applications um, to Dockerize? I think um, this is a question for Lee and Alex. If there's any sort of like gotchas or tips that can be provided as people try to containerize, um, like maybe some common hiccups that say, they can avoid. From a, a technical point of view, I think that configuration management is something you have to think about because uh, you tend to start from something that is very dynamic or have a lot of configuration on startups, so you need to take that into the image. Um, and then there are also issues around uh, log management if you are using uh, doing something complex there and also storage. So these are not necessarily uh, major challenges, but these are the questions you, you have to solve. Maybe Lee has a, has a different viewpoint. Um, 
Yeah, one of, um, I would say, um, let's say in a typical stack, um, the the easy things to to dockerize are usually uh, standard components. So a lot of um, you know the open source, especially the open source stuff that are that are very common out there. Those are pretty easy to dockerize, especially the stateless stuff. So any type of web applications um, or, or um, you know frontals, Apache Nginx, those kinds of things are are pretty easy. Um, the middleware, so your Java layers or any type of PHP stuff, that's that's not too bad either. Uh, the trickier parts are anytime you have a database, uh, just because you're you're dealing with um, data and data, you want to be persistent uh, between different um, between um, you know stopping and starting containers. So any um, like one one for example um, application. Um, a lot of CMSs that store everything in a database that can be that can be a challenge. So let's say you have a big um, a big CMS. Um, uh, those those are one of the more challenging stuff. The the Apaches, the Java's, even other standard relational databases. Those weren't difficult, but um, a big complicated CMS. Those were the ones that I found to be the biggest uh, challenges. All right, thanks, Lee. So um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, we hope you found this useful. Um, and we'll be doing more, um, as we um, have more customer examples and things, we'll feature them in subsequent webinars and share more details. Um, to close, um, here's a reminder on the reasons to, uh, you know, to dockerize monoliths and legacy applications. Um, as outlined before, start with the target application. So, you know, don't boil the ocean at once. Um, we have a free 30-day trial available for you to start playing with Docker and go to www.docker.com enterprise to learn more. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.